It's no secret that Americans are more divided than ever. And it's not just over what policies will improve our great country. No, it's over whether America is great at all, whether America deserves our love. That's why Imprimus is so important. Imprimus looks at the issues of the day from a constitutional perspective, reminding citizens always of our great heritage of liberty. For more than 50 years, Imprimus has featured speeches from the smartest conservative thinkers and writers at Hillsdale events. These days, Hillsdale publishes people like Molly Hemingway, Andy Puzder, Harmeet Dillon, and Chris Rufo. Over 6.4 million American households and businesses receive Imprimus absolutely free. And I urge you to sign up for it today at no charge. To get your free lifetime subscription, go to Hillsdale. Dot edu slash lifetime right now. Or text the word Imprimus to 71844 and we'll send you a link to sign up for your free lifetime subscription. That's I-M-P-R-I-M-I-S to 71844. Welcome to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast bringing you insight into classical education and its unique emphasis on human virtue and moral character, responsible citizenship, content-rich curricula, and teacher-led classrooms. Now your host, Scott Bertram. Thanks for listening. The Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast is part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. You also can find more information on topics and ideas discussed on this show at our website, k12.hillsdale.edu. Thanks for listening. We're joined by Gwen Yarbrough today. She is classical pedagogy trainer with the teacher support team at Hillsdale College K-12 Education. Gwen, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I listen to the show a lot, so it's sort of funny to be a part of it now. I'm very excited. And now you'll listen to yourself. That's going to be fun, I imagine. Gwen, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself as we get started and how you ended up where you are today. Sure. I am originally actually from the town of Hillsdale. So I'm a townie. That's what they call us. Um, I went to Hillsdale Academy, which is the private school that's affiliated with the K-12 office. And then I went to Hillsdale College. So I laugh sometimes when we're on the road and I say, Hopefully you're you're a little impressed or if not disappointed by me because I'm kind of a product of this experiment here. But yeah, I went to Hillsdale and having grown up learning the liberal arts, I was excited to continue that education, although I'm not sure maybe that I appreciated it as fully as I do now. I ended up being a math major. I don't think I really saw that coming. I was a Saxon math baby. So a good little calculator, but I don't think that I ever really encountered mathematics in a way that was truly beautiful, which we do see in our schools now. And I'll talk about that a little bit later with the Singapore math curriculum. But I just had a really excellent teacher at Hillsdale. His name was Dr. Jack Reinald. He actually passed away this year in January. But he just, you could just tell he really loved math and loved his students so much. And he just, there was such care in his teaching. Um, So I think that really stuck with me when I was deciding what I was going to do after I graduated. Um, My senior year was one of the first years of the classical school jobs fair at Mm -hmm. Hillsdale. Uh, Joanna Wisely was putting it on at the time. And I went and found a school in Colorado Springs. I enjoyed speaking with their staff. Actually, one of my former high school basketball coaches was teaching there. And so I interviewed with them, made a trip out there after I graduated and was offered a job teaching middle school math, which was very exciting and interesting. I started teaching when I had been 22 for about two weeks. They gave me a classroom full of kids, um, (laughs) seventh and eighth graders and kind of set me loose. And I was extremely nervous. I did not take any education classes at Hillsdale. Again, I just had my math degree. 
And I wasn't really sure how things were going to go, but I pleasantly was surprised that a large part of the school's model for teachers was to have coaching. So a delightful woman by the name of Mary Aquino was in my classroom every single day. And I don't know if it was because I was so nervous and I knew I needed help or because I had been an athlete my entire life. And so I was used to being coached, but I was so ready for it. And she was so helpful. I think I would have run screaming <laughs> out of the building <laughs> because it is very overwhelming to just, you know, have a room full of kids. Um, in particular, I had a group of eighth grade boys that were two grade levels behind in math. And I taught them twice a day and they didn't want to be there. And I wasn't quite sure how to help them. So the teacher coaching was really helpful. I ended up teaching in Colorado Springs for six years total at two different schools, three years at each. And I moved into high school math where I was teaching anything from algebra up through the second year of AP calculus. And after I was at the first school, I was still getting coached, but I remember the coach saying, oh my goodness, you're so amazing at this. I have nothing left to teach you. I probably won't come into your classroom anymore. And I remember thinking, that's insane <laughs> because I'd only been teaching for three years. So I immediately started looking for another job. I loved the second school where I was teaching and probably would have stayed there forever, except that Colorado is a very long way away from Michigan. Mm -hmm. So I did move home in 2017 and was working for the college actually in the athletic department. And then when this job with the teacher support team came up, I was just really excited. I had watched a lot of the videos that they've put out. John Gregg actually was a classmate of mine. So I was watching a lot of what uh, he was putting out regarding classical math. And I just thought, this is so beautiful. I wish I had had this when I was teaching. And so I luckily landed the job with a teacher support team and a lot of it outside of the amazing people that work in the office, I really just wanted to continue supporting this mission of classical education. And as someone who really benefited from teacher coaching, this just seemed like such an excellent way to kind of pay it forward and get into classrooms across the network and, and support them with coaching as well. On the subject of coaching, you had no education classes before entering the classroom as a teacher and said that the coaching was so important and you're doing similar things. What specifically was involved in that coaching as you were starting as a teacher that helped you so significantly? And what of that perhaps have you brought to what you were doing today? I think what was most helpful was just having another set of eyes on what was going on. I mean, I definitely knew the mathematics, so I felt very confident about what I was talking about. I had done some tutoring leading up to teaching. So uh, the way I would approach different topics with the students, especially with middle school math, I had a pretty good handle on kind of how to scaffold that for them. So it wasn't the content. It was more just kind of supporting me with putting first things first. I think when you're in an overwhelming situation and things are very new, it can be really difficult to decide kind of what needs to be tackled first. So just really helping me to focus on basic things like very strong procedures in my classroom. That's extremely helpful with eighth grade boys, but also seventh grade girls, which are, they're sneaky. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're their own breed of difficult. But yeah, I think the coaching just really started with, you know, how to how do you actually make a classroom function? What is a good use of time? What isn't? How do you make sure the kids are prepared to engage with the content you're trying to deliver? Because you could have the most beautiful things to say about any subject in school, but if the students don't know how to engage with you in the classroom or ask questions or even turn in a piece of paper, I mean, things can get away from you really quickly. So just sort of helping me concentrate on what boxes to check first and then moving on to the next thing and sort of, you know, level up in my teaching abilities. And I think that we do a lot of that when we go to schools, especially the new schools that are opening. 
we have a big mix of teachers who have either been teaching for, you know, 20, 30 years in the district school. And we also have brand new college graduates who have never had a classroom before. But teaching this classical curriculum, in particular in the grammar school, they have to learn the Singapore math program, as well as literacy essentials. And they are unique unto themselves. They're very unlike probably any way most people have been teaching math or, you know, with the different ideas about the science quotations of reading, depending on what school of thought you're from, you might not have taught in the way that literacy essentials, sort of their pedagogy for, for teaching reading. So I think that just helping them to kind of begin to approach the curriculum while making sure they are teaching classically. So a lot of emphasis on questioning and virtue instruction within the class just looks very different from from a lot of places where we see K-12 education. And so I think we really just kind of help focus their efforts, Mm -hmm. I suppose, is the succinct way to say that, so that they can quickly move towards mastery, which mastery in the classroom is kind of a different discussion, but mastery of the curriculum so that they can deliver it well to the students. But I, I think depending on what your background is, this can seem pretty overwhelming, much like I felt overwhelmed with my first classroom. And so we, we coach a lot on the practicals mm-hmm. um, as well as classical education. I want to talk a little about middle school, upper school math that you taught in, in Colorado. And that's a subject in which you're building, constantly building upon what you've learned. How do you deal with a classroom in which students are learning at, at different levels, at different rates, and yet they all have to master a concept or be familiar with a concept before you can move on and do something else? That's an excellent question. This comes up a lot. Like a buzzword in education is differentiated instruction. And often what you see in most schools is the kids sort of get sorted, you know, the sheep from the goats in math class and they stay on that track. The kids who are great at math sort of hang out together in one cohort and the kids who are maybe not on grade level or struggle more end up sort of on a different track. And it's almost as if then their history instruction becomes, you know, scaffolded and their literature instruction becomes scaffolded. And all of a sudden it's like these kids are going to two different schools and that is definitely not what we want to see. So I think engaging with all of the different resources we have in our office and also seeing this done really beautifully at a lot of schools in our network. This is perhaps not what I was doing at at the time, even when I was teaching middle school math, but the Singapore math curriculum, it really centers on a few very big research ideas, but chief among them is, is just this idea of variability. So the kids are going to see problems in a lot of different ways. And I think that that supports differentiating the instruction, if you will, within your classroom. So you can keep all of the kids, same grade level, normal cohort in their homeroom class with their regular teacher. And if the problems are being presented in a variety of different ways, or the teacher is very intentional with the way in which he is questioning the students, you can really challenge the kids who perhaps are a little more gifted in mathematics or just are more comfortable. I'll say, I really think it comes down to being comfortable and confident. You can really challenge them with certain questions. And then kids who are on grade level, you can support with sort of nudging them towards that extension idea. You're giving them a little more challenge. And then the kids who may be a little bit behind you can also be asking them a lot of questions in class. And they may be questions that you've scripted that are perhaps a little more procedural than conceptual, but you're opening the door for them to just engage in this conversation of mathematics. Again, you're increasing the confidence that they have in class. They are able to answer the questions you're asking. And if you're asking all the other students in the classroom questions as well, those kids are benefiting from hearing how 
the upper level kids are thinking about mathematics. What it really comes down to is sort of not teaching kids how to think, but almost supporting them with the questions they should be asking themselves. So the teacher is modeling thinking whenever they're working on a math problem. But what is even more powerful is if they're intentionally asking the students questions about what it is that's going on in class, all of those kids are hearing that thought process. And I just think that we can really accomplish a lot if we're getting the kids talking and answering questions in class, just hearing each other that's really going to help them a great deal. So we don't want to split them up. We see this in our new schools a lot because kids are coming, you know, maybe K to six to a brand new school and you've got third graders and fifth graders who have never seen the Singapore math curriculum before. And it, some parents say it's quote new math. It's really not. It's beautiful and correct math and it's very good instruction, but it's hard if, if they've never had to really sit and think about what is place value? How does that play into all of uh, the four algorithms that we perform in mathematics? And so I think the teacher just really has to to challenge the upper level students to explain and verbalize what it is they know, because often students really, they maybe are procedurally very strong, but they're not exactly certain why it is they're doing what they're doing. And again, that helps the lower level students to kind of really process what it is the kids are doing. I think if you just sort of set them loose in a classroom and some kids are doing all the computations in their head, they never have to say out loud what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. The other kids just think, oh, I'm not good at this because whatever it is that's happening in their brain is clearly not happening in mine. But the second you put language to it, it's very approachable. Um, It's something that a kid can model as opposed to being sort of perplexed by. Gwen, you told us earlier you were a basketball player. You also coached volleyball and basketball and cross country and track. I'm certain along the way, some of the students who you've had on those teams also have been inside your classroom. How does the relationship between teacher and student change when you have them in a classroom setting and also have them in an athletic setting? Oh, um, that is an excellent question. So I did play basketball in high school, although if anyone who knew me in high school is listening to this, they'll laugh because it was definitely my least favorite sport. I actually did track at Hillsdale College, um, but I coached all of those things. You're right about that. There were years where I had students, let's see, I coached them in cross country. I taught them math. I had them in study hall. And then in the spring, I also coach them in track. So if you add up the hours, <laughs> there were there's there are kids out there that I spent more time with during the day than, you know, anyone else, my mm-hmm. own friends and for them, their own parents. <laughs> we really spend a lot of time together. I think that it changes it changes the dynamic only in that you have So if we're teaching well, and I think even though I wasn't teaching perhaps classically intentionally because of how I, you know, came up through Hillsdale Academy and the college, it was always very evident to me that that what my teachers were doing, my favorite teachers, the best teachers, who actually also happened to be coaches, shout out Mike Roberts, but (laughs) what they really were doing is helping me form who I was as a person, perhaps a little bit through what was happening in the classroom, surely supporting me with bringing me to larger ideas about which I could think, whether it's in literature class or history or my mathematics teachers who were also coaches. There is that. But also, there was such an investment in who I was as a person and in the choices I would make and virtues that were important to them that were then important to me because they were often spoken about in in an athletic setting, but it translated. And so I think it it changes the dynamic in that it's just another access point. I don't think anyone coaching in high school or middle school necessarily needs to have ever been a college athlete or the best on their high school team. They just need to be someone who obviously is competent <laughs> in instructing in that sport, surely, and they themselves physically active. But more so than that, they have to be somebody who who truly views coaching as just another way 
of supporting students in their character formation. That's really what it is. I think that some of the most impactful coaching books I've ever read, one of them was given to me by Keith Otterbein, who's the head football coach at Hillsdale College. It really talked about the difference between a transactional coach, so somebody who really is just interested in, you know, what are you producing wins and losses versus somebody who who really is interested in your your development as a human being. And I think really that's that's what you get if your coach is also your math teacher. It's it's not that you get to talk about basketball instead of calculus or something like that. It's it's that there's truly somebody at your side all day long who holds you accountable, um, who hopes that that you will learn to be a better human and more virtuous. So it's a lot of pressure. I think if you're a coach and a teacher that there's kind of always eyes on you, but it's, it's very, it's good for the kid and it's good for, for the teacher too. I think one thing we say a lot in classical education is that it's formative for the students and the teachers. And often we're talking about the curriculum, but I think more importantly, it's, it's everyone's character formation. Um, everyone is striving to be better, you know, to think more deeply, but also to to act more virtuously as well. Final question for Gwen Yarbrough, who is a classical pedagogy trainer in the teacher support team, K-12 education at Hillsdale College. One of your goals is to help teachers learn how to bring that gift of education to students. You do that yourself. How are you able to encourage teachers to do that with and for each other? That's a great question in that depending on which school people are are teaching at, somewhere in the network and the age of the school, they have sort of different engagement with their office. And by that, I mean, if you're a brand new school, we come to you for, for new school training. We visit you in the fall. We visit you in the spring. We come back again in the fall the following year. Um, so you see a lot of us. But I think if you are at an older, more established school, perhaps outside of summer conference, which is an excellent time to get to see all of the teachers in the network. Maybe you're not seeing our faces um, as often as you had been. And so it just makes such a difference when the school leader and the deans and the coaches are delivering this message that they, they believe in this as much as we do. They are about it as much as we are. There's a handful of schools I can think of most recently Atlanta Classical was our Salvatore Prize winner, and that is truly what is going on at their school. They are very engaged with their office. They are extremely receptive to anything that we have to offer in the way of coaching or guidance, but it's a very, we learn as much from them as they do from us, really. And I think what I mean by that is it's so helpful for us to see what it is they're doing boots on the ground and their school is entirely about this mission. And it's not Hillsdale's mission. It is the mission of excellent teaching and their deans and coaches, Josh Andrews, the head of school there, Sam Clausen is the math department lead. I, I a lot deal with the math teachers. So I'm going to mention another Nikki Teeple Mm -hmm. um, at Atlanta, but there's plenty of others at other schools they are constantly coaching on this mission with their teachers. And as much as they can also be grappling with, with the big ideas that they're teaching students, as I mentioned before, it's formative not only for them, but also for the teachers. So if they can just continue to in, engage with the big ideas and talk to each other about it, One of the most helpful things, even when I was a teacher, was observing other people that were teaching with me. I think we just have to put on this this mantle of humility, if you will, and go see what we can learn from other people. And I think that the most beautiful teachers are people who who are willing to teach anyone, and they're also very willing to learn. And so getting out in your school or even out into the network and seeing how other people are doing it. That's really what the network's about. Hillsdale, at the end of the day, our office, teacher support team, people traveling around the country to help all of these schools we're involved with. There's just seven of us. It's just seven people. Mm-hmm. And our, we are entirely about this mission, but we can't be everywhere all the time. And so 
as much as the teachers can be sharing with that, uh, each other things that they think work and are willing to learn from one another, that's really what this is about. I don't think that our office purports to be sort of the fountain from which all of these ideas are spouting. We're just very excited about them. And so we we bring them places, but we didn't come up with them. So it should be perpetuated within the network and within the schools and from teacher to teacher. Gwen Yarborough is classical pedagogy teacher in the teacher support team for Hillsdale College K-12 Education. Gwen, thanks so much for joining us here on the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast. Thank you, Scott. I'm Scott Bertram. We invite you to like us on Facebook. Search for Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education. You also can follow us on Instagram at Hillsdale underscore K-12. Hillsdale underscore K-12 on Instagram. Thank you for listening to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Music